All right, sit back, relax. It's time for another Laneway Talks. Welcome everybody to Laneway Talks. Tonight we're talking to Rob Bounty from Virgin Soldiers. Um, Rob will uh, we'll go through a few things with Rob, not just his music career, but uh, he's now at the at university completing his PhD in music, and we'll find out what part of music that's in. And uh, like always, uh, welcome Rob. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Vince. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So we always start our conversations with um, where where did you grow up? So where have you come from, Rob? Um, I grew up in Adelaide. I was born in Adelaide and I grew up in Adelaide. How did you get into music? Where was the impetus to, to get into music for you? Um, my father was a musician um, and I started playing drums or in a marching band and got a scholarship to play drum set uh, with Adelaide College of Music. Um, okay. So and how old were you then? Eight years old. Okay. So when when you got that, uh, was there any inclination towards uh, drumming outside of the marching band and whatever and then developing an interest in some form of music? Yeah, it was, um, it was a drum set scholarship as well as uh, playing in the marching band. So... Yep. Um, I was pretty heavily influenced by um, youth group from church because we had a lot of bands that used to play there, um, one of them being Buffalo Drive, which is um, one of the bigger bands that came out. But there was a lot of youth bands that I used to just sit and watch. Well, hold on. Uh, let's pull that back a bit. Uh, so yep. who's Buffalo Drive? Uh, Buffalo Drive were um, a popular band during the 70s, 71. They had a hit single here that reached number eight um, called Life's Been Good to Me. Um, and they were toured nationally and internationally. Um, they toured actually for two months with ACDC. Um, and is there and, anything up on Spotify of this band? Um, no, I don't think there is. Um, I've talked to Rod Boucher, who's the singer, um, yeah. and he's, yeah, we'll get into it later, but he's yeah. one of the participants in my research. Yeah. Uh, because they're a major influence in Adelaide um, in their style of music. Um, but as far as the digital media goes, no, they have CDs and that. I went to one of their shows a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, they're all still around and living. They're in their 70s and still playing music. And it was, it was great. It was sold out. They did two sold out shows. So that was ago. your kind of influence there. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And when was that? Still 68, 69, 70? Well, that was, yeah, 69, 70, 71. Yeah. Okay, so then what yeah. happened? How did you transform out of uh, a scholarship into let's what genre of music that you wanted to play in, and you know yada yada yada? How did it go? Well, I always played drums at school because I could. Um, so even at primary school, I used to play out front in assembly and march the school round on Wednesday morning around the quadrangle, which we used to do. Um, and I played in school ensembles. Um, in grade six, grade seven. Then when I went to high school, I played in the music ensembles there and started a rock band with guys that I'm still friends with and playing with now. So that was 1972. Wow. High school. So, But we used to have bands that used to come and perform at school, like um, not Cold Chisel, but a band called Iron Knob, um, Scandal, Morpheus. I remember Scandal. And we, we, you yeah. know, we were watching an episode of Night Moves the other night and Scandal yeah. was supposed to support Skyhawks. This was like 1977 at, um, yes. Yes. at uh, I think it was where, wherever the gig was here anyway, and they weren't turning up. They'd been, you know, they were sick or something like that. But Scan I remember Scandal quite a lot, yeah. So. Yeah, it was Stuart Harrison that was the singer, and he went on to be an engineer with Wendy and the Rockets, and um, they were quite influential later on for me because we used to open for them quite a bit here in Adelaide. So, so did you? So going through, um, you would have been at primary school when you first started, and then going into high school. Yep. Um, yep. Was there a natural progression into a form of playing and whatever, or not really, you know, how did you progress? Because that's a really important age in music, I find, that 12 to 17. I won't say 18, It is, yeah. I mean, I was um, very influential, but I was, I loved the heavier bands. I mean, Cold Chisel were a local band, um, and they were heavier. And I used to go and see them when I was, like, 13, um, 13, 14, which was 73, 74 when I first started. Um, and the other heavier bands that we were hearing on the radio was from like the Glitter Band and T Rex and um, Susie Quattro. There was a lot of drumming 
intros in like all of her hits, 48 Crash, There Will Go Drive, you know, Can the Can, those three hit songs all yeah. had drum intros. Um, and we used to play them and I used to sing them and play drums in our first band at school. We used to play at the school socials, but that used to be, you know, we'd play Thorpey's live at Sunbury set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we do Susie Quattro. Yeah. Um, and status quo. I mean, that was the stuff that we were turned on to and I loved playing because it was just such a physical way to play drums. What was your what was your flavour? Were you more English rock based or more American rock based? Absolutely, yeah. I mean purple, you know, um, made in Japan came out and that was just um, we even did a project on that at school. Um, live made in Japan and they were on fire at that stage you just unstoppable so yeah I, I've that. said in other interviews at, at that age I used to essentially go out to all the import stores and just you know flick through every album every week and see what new you know new record had come out and you hadn't heard of a lot of them because, you know, we didn't have the internet. And so yeah. you had to really go by the cover and then go, can you play this for me to see whether you liked it or not? Yeah, I, I did that a lot walking home from school. There was a record shop on the way home from school on Brighton Road. And um, I'd do that, I'd stop. And I actually spend all my allowance. I'd buy either a single or I'd save up for four or five weeks because an album was five ninety five. Oh, that's so. right. It was a lot of money. I mean, yeah, a lot and I bought, of money. And Sabbath played here in... Uh, 74, 75, I think, British Music to the World with Status Quo. And yep. that turned me on the Sabbath as well because I sat outside of that concert and went, these guys are awesome. So, um, so therefore, you get to you get to your adolescent um, years and you so you're getting towards, let's call it the licence years, <laughs> get your licence and whatever. Uh, yeah, 16. Uh, yep. And, uh, and so what were you thinking? Were you thinking, that's it, we're going to, you know, I've got to, get to Melbourne where, you know, the big smoke is or I'm going to go to Sydney um, and I'm going to make music my life? Um, not at all. I finished, I actually stopped playing music when I left school. Yeah. Um, I had a few issues with teachers and playing in bands and guys that used to hang around the bands and we had, um, I mean, you had the Sharpie movement. We had the similar sort of thing over here. We had gangs. Yeah. And I got into a bit of strife at school. Yeah. So I just had a gut full. So I stopped playing when I left school, which was 15, and I didn't actually start again until I was 18, 19. So I had a three-year break. I mean, I went and saw bands, you know. used to go and see, as I said, Chisel used to go and see them a lot, um, Mickey Finn and those sorts of blues bands. But, yeah, I didn't well, actually play. So what actually got you back then? Uh, a friend of mine, blues player called Ross Phelps, um, I was working in a factory on the line at um, a printing place, Griffin Press, and it was the most depressing place ever to work, and everybody was just one of the kill themselves, and I think they were all dead inside, except Ross, and he was into music and in the same, and Van Halen had just come out, and he turned me on to Van Halen 1, and I just went, wow, and that really re-sparked and rekindled my interest to want to play, listening to Alex Van Halen going, <laughs> That's unbelievable. In 76, I think that was there. So, so uh, no, it was later than that, 77. Okay. And so, yeah. uh, therefore, yeah. where do you progress to in a band? Uh, well, I started playing with Ross and um, a few old schoolmates. Um, we all moved into a house together. And um, I actually had a surf shop that I was running at 18 years old. But we all lived in the house and started playing um, and jamming. And a friend of mine from school, I worked at EMS Records year in 76 after I'd left school. So I was actually in the industry, but I wasn't playing drums. So I was sitting in on sessions. Um, I met uh, Mark Meyer, who was playing with David Ninnis. Oh, yeah. In sessions with him. Yep. Um, JJ Hackett, who ended up playing with Mondos. Yep. Um, and I'd met all those guys sort of at the sessions, and I just used to sit there in the control room and watch them set up in the afternoon if I could sort of sneak out of my section of the building. And... Um, um, that was yeah, that was really important, and that engineer was my best friend. So he moved in with us down at Moana. We moved down south, and it was just basically surfing and working on my shop. And um, he had a PA hire company as well. So I started working with other bands uh, with a PA hire company, and I was just doing lights and lugging. And it kind of got me back into the industry at that level. Um, and I was watching other bands. And Do you consider yourself up, kind of professional at that stage? Well, I could still play. Um, I wouldn't call, my, call myself a professional at that stage, but we were recording because um, we had the just a two-track and the live desk and we wrote all these songs. Um, you know, I think we've written about 20, 30 songs at that stage. Mm. 
And uh, I was doing a gig with a band over here called The Modes. I was doing lights and lugging, and the power went out of the gig that they were doing. And um, their drummer got up and did a drum solo. And Mal, the engineer friend of mine, Mal Hay, said, you get up and do one too. I went, no, nah, I don't want it. He went, get up and play a drum solo. So I got up and played a solo after their drummer. And I thought it was awful, but anyway, I get a phone call from the bass player from the Modes on the Monday going, um, do you want to join the band? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and so, I, I, so that was I mean, the start, yeah? Yeah, at that stage, all I wanted to do was just play for a big PA yeah. and, you know, play in pubs because that's what everyone was doing. Well, not everyone, but that's what I really aspired to do. So, yeah, I got the gig with the Modes. That was in December 82, and I've basically been gigging ever since, I think. <laughs> right. And so and that, so what happened? Did you then move to Melbourne then after that? Um, I toured with the Modes. For, we did the Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland, back to Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide. We did that for like two years non-stop. We did, I counted up like 240 gigs a year. Yeah. Which is a lot of gigs, but you used to work six, seven nights a week. Yeah, exactly. Um, and one, the manager from Wendy and the Rocket saw myself and the singer Diane in the band here, the mode that we were touring with, um, and he asked us to come to Melbourne to start a new band because the mode was, the keyboard player wanted to go to uni and I was kind of coming towards the end of that. So I moved over to Melbourne with Diane initially um, under the invitation of Jeff Hughes. Um, and, I mean, Jeff managed oh, – he played in the Vibrance originally. Yeah. Um, but he managed Wendy the Rockets and Christy Allen and uh, – I mean, you've probably – heard of him or seen him, but Mushroom anyway. Well, no, no, funnily enough, uh, you know, I know I know those bands well. And, yeah. Uh, I didn't know Christy Allen, but I know a lot of stories because I was at Mushroom from about 84 yeah. onwards, so I got told the stories, yeah. and they're, they're not good stories. Um, they're no. poor old Christy, but Wendy yeah. I, I knew intimately, you know, we became good friends with her and Paul Norton, uh, you know, and their husband and wife. Yeah. And um, right. yeah. we, yeah, became good friends. But no, I didn't know, man, it kind of Wendy and the Rockets were just a bit before my time there. And I, yeah. uh, you know, and I know Joey Amenta quite well, and we were talking about yeah, that the yeah, other yeah, day. Yeah. And I was just only looking at the video, probably only two days ago, um, from Wendy and the Rockets and, uh, and just, yeah. and, and, you know, viewing it. But no, I didn't. So therefore, you come to Melbourne. So what's the story? Who are you playing with? Um, well, we landed in the lap of a band there called the Phantom Band. Um, I, was, I was living with the bass player, Pog, and his wife, Heather. Mm. Um, and the band we put together was with Diane, Pog, uh, playing bass, me playing drums, and we went through a few guitarists and couldn't really find anyone. I think Joey was meant to be in that, but it never really happened. Yeah. Um, so Jim Hocking um, oh, started playing yep. with him. And well, there's Pog. a real name. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Jimmy was um, fantastic to play with. He's such a brilliant, talented guitar player. And I, he's been, um, I respect the seven, I think, or Jimmy the Human and the Astros at that yep. stage. I filled in for a few gigs because Christian, their drummer, Jimmy's drummer, um, dropped out for a while. So I just blindly, Jimmy rang me up one afternoon and he said, can you do a gig tonight? And I went, what? Because um, I'd been kind of rehearsing some of their songs and listening to his tapes and his yeah. music to get you know, some sort of vibe to write. And I went, okay. So I went over to uh, Jim's place and we rehearsed through a set. And I went, where's the gig? He went, oh, at the venue. I went, okay, opening <laughs> for Kevin Boric. And I went, <laughs> What? <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd never played these songs before live, yeah. and, and I'm up there. I mean, Jimmy and Pog were next level musos, and you know, still are. Yeah, Jimmy's a sensational guitar player, and he's absolutely. a brilliant writer too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I got you know, sort of thrown in the deep end, and up there, and I'm playing. I I, I walk behind Christian's kit because everything was set up. Yeah, and I looked up, and I mean, the venue was full. I don't know what it held. It was a couple of thousand people, but upstairs at the venue, yeah, there would be uh, probably eighteen hundred. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was Pat because KB was, you know, headlining. Be on and, fire um, in those years, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, they were firing too, you know, even though because um, KB was a hero of mine back from Celebration Days and mm. Johnny Annis, you know, I loved his playing as well. Mm. So, Absolutely. Um, great player. Again, another tragic story there. It is. It, the industry will bite you. Yeah, there's no and doubt. Well we can talk about that. There's a lot yep. of that. So, therefore, yep. you're doing that, and uh, you haven't got to Virgin Soldiers yet, though, have you? No, nah, well, the funny thing is, 
Um, I had a few gigs, as I said, a few gigs with the Astros, and it wasn't really working out. Um, and I think I'd left that, and I had to get a job because I wasn't getting any income. Yeah. So I scored the gig at Brackers in 108 Elizabeth Street in the drum department. Oh, yeah. And one of the guys from, I think it was Fair Warning, came in, the guitar player, and said, oh, he said me play with Jimmy, I think, and Jimmy and Paul, and he said, oh, do you want a gig? There's a band called Virgin Soldiers looking for a gig. And I went, oh, okay. And sure, you know. And anyway, Gibbo came in, uh, the singer, Steve Williamson, yeah. from the Soldiers, came in and gave me a demo that they recorded. And I listened to it, and the first track was Make a Change, and I went, oh, wow, this is awesome. Um, and I, yeah, I'm still a fan of the Soldiers' music, and it was from the first time I heard that tape. Um, I went and had a rehearsal. Um, I didn't really want to. I didn't think I'd get the gig. I didn't think I was actually good enough to get the gig, but the wife kicked me out of the house and said, go and do it anyway, doesn't matter. Um, and I remember, um, long story short, but Mike Lynch, the rep from Palmer Drums, got the first double bass drum pedal in the country through Australia's music, and he sent it down from Sydney. He said, here, Robbie, try this out. And that was like a, the day before or a couple of days before the soldiers' rehearsal. Yeah. So I took the double bass drum pedal along, and I'd never played one before. I set it up, and I just went for it. And they just went, whoa. And I think that's why I got the gig. <laughs> I've got to say, I've never, never, ever used a double drum pedal. Oh, I, you have to. It's a whole new – it's like driving a V8. Yeah, no, I can't. I'm a, I'm a four-cylinder and a, a small six-cylinder driver. Um, <laughs> so – so there's there's the um, so there's the basic birth of Virgin Soldiers, correct? That's it. So from there, how does it how does it rock on? I mean, uh, you start getting a few gigs. Um, you know, the well, band. they had plenty of gigs booked. They just needed the drummer because they were burning through drums, yeah. um, as bands tend to do. And they were pretty well established um, with their writing. Um, they burnt through a few guitar players, but the Soldiers have been going since 1981, right? Originally. Um, and they were all down from the valley, from Morwell and um, down that way. And they were in Melbourne and they were on a mission. So they were writing. Uh, we rehearsed three nights a week and we'd play a couple of gigs a week. And when we got enough money, we went into the jam tent, which, yep. which is where we rehearsed with Bruce Johnson. Down when in, he owned it. Down in Cheltenham. That's it. Um, yeah. And Bruce Johnson. Yeah, no, Bruce. Used to own it. Yeah, yeah, no, Bruce. Everyone knows yeah. Bruce's front of house cipher oasis is one of his claims to fame after that. Yeah. Blows my mind. But anyway. Um, he recorded the first demos. I mean, that Junkies track that I sent you, Bruce recorded that, and I had my Simmons SDS7 kit on that track um, that I just sent you, which is well, Junkies Parrot. Well, hopefully when you get me a cover, we can release it. Um, that's happening as we speak. We're just deciding on which cover to use. Because, Fantastic. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. So, therefore, yeah. you go through, so the, the Virgin Soldiers uh, are on their way then, um, you're not signed yet, but just about to be signed, correct? Yeah, I mean, Sid Gorman, um, have, would you still record bands for the White Album, uh, White Label, sorry? Yeah, the White Label, label which is part of the Mushroom Group, yeah. So, That's right, and they were interested in something, so we recorded the EP, um, released it through well, our own label, and Sid and Gorman engineered it, and Cole Watt engineered and produced it. Um, then we recorded the album in the same studio, in Sid's studio in South Melbourne, I think it was. Mm. Um, and we were shopping it around. I spoke to everybody. And we got management at that stage, John Blanchfield. Well, John's a name. Yeah. Um, and he took us on after going through several different people. I mean, I was friends with Jerry Spizer as well, from Men at Work, yep. um, through the industry, because Jerry used to import GW drums. Yeah. He originally brought them into Australia, and I used to sell his product. And with the soldiers, he wanted me to try out this rack system. So um, I had a lot of conversations. Jerry came down to rehearsals, the Virgin Soldiers rehearsals, and talked us through the process of getting signed and, you know, where to, and how to go about it, which was really good. And, you know, um, Jerry's just that type of guy. Very cool. Great drummer. And we ended up, and I've told you the story, we were sitting in Gadinsky's office um, and we had the album, the demo there. And Michael came up the stairs and all I heard was, can I swear? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, not really. We don't want to swear. Yeah. He said, oh, who, who are these blokes? And, um, you know, you know Virgin Soldier, he goes, who handles them? And the, I can't remember the secretary's name. She went, oh, Blanchfield Management. He goes, ah, get him out of here. That's right. He uh, wouldn't have anything to do with John Blanchfield. No, nah, because John and him had history. Um, I think it was through Mondo's, actually, funnily enough. Um, and we were bore the brunt of that. So, cut a long story short, we kind of walked out there 
disenchanted. Um, and Greta from Metal from Melbourne and yep. Central Station yep. loved the album. Yep. Um, and they forked out the bucks so we could release it. And, um, yeah, they kind of ruined the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which we've got to live with for the rest of our lives. So, well, look, you yeah, know, I mean, from a perspective of a local band, it's probably where it got to, whereas I think you probably should have gone to England and lived in England, and um, I think that you would have got a, a massive following in the UK and Europe where yeah. Virgin Soldiers, um, it, being that flavour of English rock, would have worked so well. It's it's a lot harder to work that genre here, a lot harder, and very rare to ever get it off the ground because we are a pub rock, uh, you know, country, and that cut pub rock uh, has rhythm and blues in it, and therefore yeah. you guys were so much London-centric, and then I'd go Germany, Italy, um, all yeah. those territories. So, um, you know, Virgin Soldiers have done their thing that, you know, you didn't get signed, so it didn't happen. Um, and then I know that Steve went on to to uh, form Sump, but where, yeah. where did you go to? Were you with Sump? No, I left the Soldiers in 91, um, and I was still in Melbourne, um, and I managed uh, a store called Drum City in France. Yeah. And then my wife got ill, um, so we had to come back to Adelaide for family support, so I left Melbourne yep. in 93. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, when I came back to Adelaide, I really... Settled in? Had a, yeah, so I didn't, you know, I had a gut full again. You know, I'd sort of been the whole soldiers period and all that working with bands because I was doing cover gigs, you know, we were doing the Linden Tree and all these other weird cover places in 92, 93. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was working six days a week. It, well, it always so, gets to a point if you if you have not made it in music where it's supporting you financially, um, yeah. yeah, there comes a time that if you're going to have a family, you've got to have that family. That family requires money. You've got to get a job. You've got to do the normal day-to-days. But I, I think from, I mean, then you, you've you worked in music stores ever since, really, haven't yeah, you? No, I, no, I've worked in music stores all the way through. Right. I've so never you, stopped working in music stores. So you've really <laughs> lived and breathed music anyway, either way, whether you're in a band or whether you're yeah. selling equipment or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're very lucky, and I think it probably, I could go back to what you said earlier when you were working in the printing company and... Um, Everybody was brain yep. dead. And could you imagine having a life? It's like going into working in an insurance company and, I don't know, doing data entry. Um, it would essentially kill you if you've if you lived and breathed music. There's no way you could ever go into that and do that. So, so yep. therefore, that's what you've done there, okay, and you've built, you know, you've stayed in Adelaide, you've, um, you've had a family and everything that goes with it. I mean, I – now – for everybody that's listening, uh, the style that I put Rob into, he's not Neil Pert. What he is is he's Ian Pace. So your style <laughs> of drumming to me is Ian Pace, hard hitting and um, super tight. We know Neil Pert's tight and whatever, but to me Neil yeah. Pert is a lot more uh, free-flowing in what he does. Uh, you, to me, come within Ian Pace's um, style. It's, uh, it's hard and it knows exactly what it's got to represent by the beat when you're playing in the band and, and whatever. Yeah. So you, then you've – so and, you know, and, and the other thing is too, when you mention the double pedal and the rack system and all that, I mean, I've played drums my whole life myself, but for me it's been more about the music than the drums. I don't know if that makes sense. And oh, would, I, well, would I say for you it's more about the drums than the music? I know the music means everything, but the drums – would have that 1% more to you, whereas to me, the music has the 1% more, so the drums um, uh, lose out type thing. Yeah, I don't know whether I'd agree with that entirely. Okay. Yep. I mean, I've always played guitar and sung as well. Yeah. Um, so I've always written music, and yep. I like the compositional aspect of it as well. Yeah. I play keys. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I was good at playing drums, so I just I kept doing it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, gotcha. But, so, I mean, I was even, you know, today was, sort of looking over this, but I used to, people used to come up and ask me to teach them all the time after gigs, you know, oh, do you teach, do you teach? And I went, oh, you know. Um, so I did start when I was in Melbourne at Drum City um, yeah. doing a few private lessons. 
I, and, I couldn't um, think anything worse. I couldn't stand it. Yeah, I, was, I mean, it's just, it was just a lot of fan of the band, really. Um, I didn't do anyone outside of sort of that because they got what I was doing, you know. Uh, but, I mean, I was, I was studying with Frank Corniola in Melbourne, you know, for yeah. four years, you know, because mm. uh, the, the standard of Melbourne drummers, I mean, you know, it's, it's a beautiful compliment. Thank you about Ian Pace and Neil Pitt. But, yeah. Um, the drummers in Melbourne were next level. You know, I used to go and see Virgil on a Tuesday night at the grain oh, store. Oh yeah, network for five bucks, and I'd sit side side stage and just try to comprehend what the hell Virgil was doing and how he was doing it. Yeah, awesome drummer. As I say, John uh, An- John Annis, awesome drummer. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, Johnny Annis used to come to the Linden Tree at like two, three in the morning, and you know, he'd get up and have a hit with Rich, Richie Moore. So I did that gig with. Oh yeah. Um, and Stu, uh, sorry, Stu, I can't remember your last name. Um, Stu Storm, we used to call him. Um, right. Johnny Annis was just tearing it apart. No, but different, you know, those guys are just so technically competent and musically competent. Uh, but Virgil's in a whole league of his own. Oh, there's no um, doubt. I, I think that John Annis was there too, but unfortunately we know things went a bit skew if. But um, yeah. I used to radio, and I'd watched quite a lot working on some videos where he's playing in. And um, yep. it some of his um, his rolls, more rolling around the drums, not the rolls on the snare or something, uh, yeah. were just so good and they're so in time and they're so effortless. Um, whereas I find Virgil Donati is a rolls man, so he's on the snare roll it he's a neil pert you know he rolls it and 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 does it and does yeah. it with super power um yeah and feet and independence but his concept of time is otherworldly mm, um mm. and he, he you know at that level it's you know like a, a phrase that you just have to get it mm. um like jazz drummers have mm. this thing good competent jazz drummers and those orchestral players um, you know, they, they get it. They can see it in another level that um, us mere mortals can't. Mm. That's why they can, you know, they have the technical facility they've worked on, but they also have the brain to be able to use it. Um, and that's the really the, the big difference, I think, between a, a lot of musicians is um, we're not all blessed with that level of intelligence. <laughs> well, there's always, yeah, there's always someone better, I say. Um, so, oh, and, and that's, that's great there is, you know. Yeah, they're, no, they're, they're, and that's the great thing about it. So, yep. so therefore, then, let's... Now, let's move it forward. So that's what's happened, okay? Now let's move it forward. You're at university and you're doing your PhD in music. Yeah, I've been at uni since 2014. And what are you you doing your... uh, Well, there's the degree and then there's music, uh, PhD. So what are you doing your PhD in? Um, It's historical musicology um, and it's about the iconic South Australian sound from 1962 to 1994 but it also has a perspective of Melbourne musicians because I've been in Melbourne and I have a lot of friends um, who are musicians in Melbourne. And the thing is, it's, yeah, it's a history, but it's also a pedagogical study of how these guys learnt what they did and did what they did. Well, what, what uh, I'll do is I, I'm going to cut out the 60s because I hate the 60s. I hate 60s <laughs> music, all right? And because I'm interviewing, I'll lead where the conversation's going. So we're going to cut out the 60s. Sure. Uh, and because I wasn't there, um, it has, I, I, yeah, I have no, so we move into the 70s, which to me was from 60, late 69 onwards, in it, getting into yep. 70, and then into, yep. your, into the 70s, is the most colourful, creative period for music that I could ever imagine in my life, and that is around the world. And so we're yep. in that you know, here, yep. whether it be Melbourne or Adelaide. Now, Adelaide, yep. to me, had some fantastic bands. So if we go back to 70, 75, I would pick out Stars, bands like Stars and whatever. Yeah, I mean, they live down the road from where I grew up. Wow, so oh, what a band, you, you know. Them. Yeah, what yeah. a band. And and you yeah. could tell, um, uh, you know, obviously we had the Andy Durant um uh, you know, may he rest in peace, and yeah. he passed away with melanoma. But what a songwriter! And he was the nucleus of the band. I felt. I mean, you had a great singer. Now, and, feeling uh, it's, it's beautiful singer. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and you got Roger playing bass. It's like yeah, Roger McLaughlin. <laughs> so you got a great bass player. And Alice is on guitar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I, I to me. That was great, but we had so many other bands. So can we go through that period in there and and just 
go through a few that you you've researched and have come into your um, your uh, you know thesis or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest influence for me. I mean, I um, played with him right, and um, he's still a very close friend, a guy called Glenn Christopher, who was in a band in Sydney in sixty six, sixty seven. It was called the Black Diamond, and they were like a surf punk band, rock band, heavier band then. Um, and Black Diamond sent in this timepiece, and and they used to support um, Yeezy Beat. And he was friends with George um, and the boys, and he sort of, Glenn, in my research, I go into the story a lot more about um, Angus and Malcolm and Glenn's association with that and what he went. But he was also a great songwriter. He got a call from Vince Lovegrove about replacing Bond because Bond was about to leave fraternity right. and join ACDC. So Glenn got a call in Sydney from Vince Lovegrove to come down and audition with fraternity, you know, would you join and play Bond? And Glenn said, oh, yeah, yeah sure. Um, and he loved Adelaide because he had space to tour here a lot as well. Um, and he knew uh, Beeb and the Bertles and um, oh, there's so many names there to list like from Glenn's interview. But um, there was a big community in Adelaide that Glenn knew of. So he came down here, went to the rehearsal um, with, it was fraternity, but it was just turning into Mickey Finn. Oh, yeah, uh, yep. Because of the relationship between the different players. Barnsley sort of was in and out. Swanee was in and out. Uh, Bruce Howe, the bass player, was kind of running it and guiding it. And John Freeman was playing drums. Um, and so Joff Bateman, they used to switch. But John Freeman, Bruce Howe, and the boys were pretty fiery. Um, still are. They were good. I mean, they had a really strong sense of self. And there's big personalities and you know what that's like in a rehearsal room sometimes oh yeah Glenn walked in in the middle of a fiasco and he kind of went hang on this is too heavy for me man so he walked out and went nah um, and he ended up with Rick Morrison um, who you probably know from Master's Apprentices and no no I, 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 I don't you know and uh, there's some there's some acts I know very little about and I the ones okay. I yeah but Mickey Finn yeah. I know a lot about yeah, I mean, well, everyone knows the Masters Apprentices, right? Yeah. Rick Morrison yeah. was a guitar player. Right. And Glenn was asked by Rick to join Red Eye, which is a country rock band here in Adelaide that had a residency at a place called the Seacliff Hotel for years. Um, and I ended up working with Mal doing sound um, and going to see Red Eye because they lived down the road from where I live. So they played down the road from where I live and struck up a relationship with Glenn, started playing in the band with him. Yeah. Um, so all of that history that Glenn has in his head, I went, he's a great research participant. But all of my research in my thesis for my PhD is through personal uh, associations I've had with people. Um, so I've got like a connection. Um, it, I do source journalistic um, articles. Well, 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 I want to ask you, uh, Rob, what, yep. what do you see 70 to 75 as? Well, you know, tell me a little bit about 70 to 75. I, I, I could rattle off so many art. To me, 19, 1973 has got to be the most creative period for rock bands in the world, 1973. Yeah, well, I mean, that's because the liquor licensing law changed. And, as, you know, all the bands basically had a gig till 10 o'clock and then it went later till 12 o'clock and they got bigger rooms and had to fill rooms. I mean, you had big rooms over there that Thorpe used to play in. Yeah. Um, and um, and middle of the valley, I mean, Thorpey was the, the originator of that early period. Yeah. And he was the one that used to go to the thing called the door deal. Um, right. And where he turned around, the band started making money when he started to implement that system of getting paid because they had to fill big rooms. Right. But the thing is, when they go into big rooms, PAs weren't that powerful and neither were the guitar amps. You know, some of them were, but they weren't really affordable. Yeah. Um, so there was big guys around that were making amplifiers big enough to fill the beer barn, um, which is 1,000, 2,000 seaters, especially in Melbourne. But mm. here in Adelaide, we had a place like the Bridgeway and the Finn. Was, was Strauss a local? Um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, funny enough, um, Sid Gronman used to make amplifiers, phone amplifiers for Thorpe and ACDC. Right. Um, you know, and they were big amplifiers. If you have a look, you know that um, the clip for a long way to the top where ACDC are going down Watson Street? Yep, yep, yep. Have a look at the names on the amplifiers. There's Sid Gromman's amplifier. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, so I've got, I've got all those connections with Sid, with Kyle Ward. Cole used to be uh, front of house guy for Billy Thorpe, you know, so um, and the, the soldiers sort of fell into that pub rock, heavy, loud 
category as well. So it all sort of ties in. So, so my research. Is, so seventy to seventy five is when yeah. our our basic pub rock rhythm and blues that that's in there um, was developing or had developed. I think it was um, it was developing, but it was in the later stages of it. Yeah. From the seventy yeah, yeah seventy to seventy five. As I said, the liquor laws uh, changed. Well, actually changed in the late sixties, but um, both here in Adelaide and the same in Melbourne. Um, Sydney had a similar thing with their licensing laws. Um, so, yeah, that's when people went to pubs and went to see bands, but bands got louder. So the style of music was basically created by it was alcohol fuel, right? But, um, you know, we, we, if we go through the, the genre of music, in, in that period to me, they were kind of fairly similar whether it be prog rock or that rhythm and blues, pub rock or blues or whatever, it was yeah. fairly similar. We, we, you know, uh, if you went to the UK, for example, in that period, there was a lot more coming out of the edges, you know, experimental. We weren't quite as experimental. Would you think that's correct? I don't know whether I'd agree with that either. Okay. If, if you had a look at, um, you listen to Timepiece and Black Diamond, which is, you know, late 60s in Sydney, Mm. You listen to their album and it's really prog. You have a listen to um, the Levi Smith's class, Barry McCaskill, you know. You listen to those guys in the late 60s, early 70s. It's super prog. Mm. You know, that's out of Adelaide. And mm. I mean, Barry and the class did uh, that, all those residencies in Sydney and then Melbourne. So, um, but that style of music was really experimental. Um, I mean, you know, Ross, you know, Mike Rudd, the Sons of the Vegetal Mother and... Um, Red Angel Panic you had over here as well, which was John Freeman and his schoolmates. I mean, those guys are really progressive in what they were doing. Well, if you get to – so if you get to then 75 to 80, yeah, what's happening then, Rob? Skyhooks. <laughs> so, uh, you, you, see, what comes to mind to me – interesting, you are 100% correct, but they don't yeah. come to mind, although I loved Skyhooks, but, uh, but they, don't, are, they don't come to mind. What comes to mind to me is one of the punk greatest, starting to happen. Yeah, but, they, but Skyhooks were a reaction to that. They saw it and they were smart enough. Um, you know, McCainch and Sherl and um, Red, I mean, yeah. they, they really switched on fellas. Yeah. And they, they were the antithesis of that. But they also brought Australianism into music, and we loved that because there was also that cultural cringe of, you know, not coming out of ourselves and going, oh, it's embarrassing. But Skyhook turned it around, you know. They turned everything on its head, um, and that they were progressive. You listen to the, the technicality, and, you know, like Freddie Strauch's drumming is mind-blowing. Mm. You know, mm. I still sit there to the day and watch him and go, I haven't got a clue how he's doing anything. <laughs> Yeah, he's right. It was never one of my favourite drummers. I um, I oh, must admit, man, he's but he's he's, he's but he's. I, no, I agree that he's fantastic. There's no doubt. Yeah, but yeah. it's like uh, John Watson. I, ne- I never thought much of John Watson either. Oh, what a great! He's a great. He's a great drummer, right? And but, he's a really nice bloke. Um, he remembers. He uh, remembers people's names and faces. So, you know, yeah. I, I was more. Um, I was more taken back by English drummers at the time, and. Uh, and they weren't quite as, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you think Judas Priest and Thin Lizzy and those guys, they weren't quite as good as drummers we were just mentioning. But I liked their style, uh, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, they, those things were changed. Mean, you look at Buffalo. Um, yeah. Jimmy? You know, they were, yeah, Jimmy, yeah, I mean, Jimmy I Akinumo, Jimmy's yeah. Over here now. Hey? Um, in Adelaide, I see Jimmy quite a bit. I saw him the electronic drum kit. Well, he, I used to now I used to love his drumming and I'd saw Buffalo play I mean I've seen all these bands play of course. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah. and I saw Buffalo play quite a few times. And yeah. he I loved his drumming stuff. I just loved what he used to do. Um, yeah. and some of those sounds they used to get on the records where they'd put some effects through his drums were just fantastic. Yeah. Um yeah, but I mean, they were, you know, they were progressive in what they did too. They were really yeah. trippy and psychedelic, you know. Yeah. I, I love that about Buffalo. Um, you know, but that era, I mean, they opened for Black Rainbow Sa- here. And that, Black that Sabbath too, time. didn't they? Yeah, I, I didn't see him here with Sabbath, but I saw him here with Rainbow. And, yeah. I, you know, I went out and I bought Mother's Choice because that yeah. was the album I think they had out. Yeah, that was yeah. kind of yep. two, three albums down the track. And then I kind of went back and um, you know, the earlier albums, but they're so heavy and like they're, 
I sound like Sabbath. At yeah. the same time, Sabbath was sounding like Sabbath. You know? So we funny, had all that. Funny you off. say that, you know, and I was do an interview with Joey Amanta the other day and we were talking about that and I, we all, we all felt that the first Taste album um, yeah, was after I've Cloud Nine. Yeah, we yeah. felt that was Black Sabbath influenced at the time. Um, tickle Your Fancy. Well, yeah, now Tickle Your Fancy isn't, isn't nowhere near Black Sabbath but some of the songs on that yeah. album were very, for us anyway, were very Black Sabbath influence, and he said, "Yeah, he thought that too." And yeah, but you listen to Virgil's drumming, and he sounds like Neil Peart. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. He's and not he's fifteen. Yeah, absolutely. It just <laughs> I, at, at the time, I, I just loved it, and I thought this band could become the Australian Black Sabbath. But then the second album was just atrocious. Anyway, that's another yeah, but story. I, think that, I mean, I don't know. I haven't spoken to Joey, or even I wouldn't even go there with Virgil because um, <laughs> I know he. He has a bit of a cringe about that period of time because, he, you know, um, I think the whole look and thing that was I mean, what does Virgil like, even do now? Who does he play with? Uh, his band's called Icefish. He's living in Europe at the moment, but he has a place in LA as well. I mean, I speak with Virgil every time he comes into town. and um, he's, yeah, he's a wonderful guy um, because I've worked with him a lot over the years from the mid-'80s yeah. all the way through to, you know, I think we had him over here a couple of years back. Um, and he's touring Europe mainly, and his band's called Ice Fish, and the lead singer of that, they actually do, uh, there's a cover of Burn, that, is it Burn or no, it's Stormtrooper oh, yeah. that I've watched, and it's just ridiculous. But are, um, are they a big band, or does he? Or is he a hired hand, and he plays with a lot of big artists over there? He does, but he does his own thing. Um, it's very progressive, yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he's he's really busy all the time, but yeah. through Europe, you know. Um, yeah. If you don't, I follow Virgil online and um, watch a lot of his stuff, and he's doing a lot of clinics, a lot of workshops, and just playing with these brilliant European players. Yeah. But yeah, you know, there is few I've never heard of them. But you know, we're in the middle of nowhere with a quarter of the population. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, we represent you know, a blimp. With, you know, Germany's got eighty-five million people. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> You know, yeah. So, world, I well, tell me, um, you know, uh, how do you how do you see how the whole music industry has progressed? And we know, you know, I I, I often have to have that terrible discussion with the older musicians. Please don't talk to me about physical CDs. They're an environmental disaster. Uh, vinyl isn't too far behind. These things never br- <laughs> never break down and go into landfill and um, are an absolute scourge on the world. Um, and so going digital has had some really good environmental impacts and it is where the world's going anyway. So we have to say to um, ourselves, well, you know, we have to move with that. I, you know, and, and I get back to, well, you know, could you make some CDs? Look, please, they don't even sell at gigs anymore. It's very hard to even sell at gigs. And vinyl is so expensive and they keep telling us how it's a big revival. Well, it's a big revival over virtually nothing. So it's mm. a nothing to a nothing. So it represents very little dollars. But So we know it's a digital world. We know that Spotify is raping and pillaging. And... Um, we know that and because, I mean, the CEO of Spotify is on $24.5 million plus bonuses and and their executive structure are all on huge dollars. And that is a yeah. blasphemy and that is, well, that is blasphemy on, on our industry. And, yeah. um, you know, it, how you could even justify any of that is beyond me. But then the major record labels are in cahoots with all of this too. And if you have a look at something like... Um, uh, Vivo, which is owned by the majors, uh, they've yeah. got their tentacles into everything um, and we can't trust them on any level. And uh, all they know is that they're a corporation and uh, they're geniuses at the top and they must live like kings and the people that make it, only one or two will make some money, the rest of them will live like paupers. And that's, yeah. I might be sounding, you know, a bit rash in saying those things, but... It really, I mean, I've been on both sides of the fence, so I can mm. talk from real experience. I was one of those animals at, you know, some stage in my life. But yeah. um, how do you how do you view the transition now? And we're very, we at Laneway Music are 
fully digital. That's what we are. We're about to launch a new platform, which we'll announce yep. soon. And, yep. um, you know, we're, we're focused on the future in that, on that basis and we see it as a bright future and artists need to come to grips with digital, whether it be social media or, or whatnot. You need to promote yourself in the old days, it'd be posters or it'd be the um, Impress or Beat magazine. Well, now it's social media. So it'd be Facebook, Instagram or whatever, if you yep. want to say TikTok yep. and YouTube. Um, yep. So how do you view all this, Rob? Um, I mean, I cut my research off at 92 because I think that um, is really when everything changed globally. Um, all the majors went from 12 down to 4. Um, I know Murdoch had his hands in festival, um, but... Michael, I know it all well. I was I was all there, mate. So I know I'm, you were there, but I've I think for I know the detail. In, in my learned opinion, and I'll use that phrase. Yeah. Um, and in my research, yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out um, through evidence, not rhetoric, which is difficult to do in our industry because our industry is built on rhetoric. It's not built on fact. Um, a lot of the time, so that's why I'm a bit of a pioneer at the academic level. I'm trying to get the fact as well as you can, about what that change was. Um, and you're right, it's changed globally, but everybody had their fingers in those pies that you're talking about now mm. back in the 90s. They saw it all coming. Mm. Um, and, yeah, we basically have to accept it or fall by the wayside. Um, 100%, it, yeah. It, it's difficult for, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm 62. I'm not completely past it, but um, I come from, you know, I'm in a room full of books, CDs, albums, and magazines and, you know, um, and guitars and drums. But I like the tactile sensation of opening up a Led Zeppelin album and having to look at the lyrics or opening up a Rush album and reading how Neil, you know, composed the lyrics for the well, song. Well, you see, well, I, I, I know what you're talking about there, okay? So I get yeah, it. I don't... I, but, but I, I truly believe... Sorry to cut in, Rob. I truly believe yeah. that we, we, we're we getting to that and they did have a couple of cracks at it over the last 10 years but the internet wasn't good enough and i truly well, believe we are going to get to that in a digital form so i'm very positive that what you get in all of that and, and you know yes you can open it up and you've got all the reading and whatever we are going to get to that in a digital form it's on its way now um but if i if i go back to the early 80s and you had to spend money recording and there was a lot of money involved a lot of money so now let's go to today and say you can record an album in your bedroom and you can and it can sound world class there is no doubt about it okay and, and, it sound like crap too yeah oh, oh absolutely as it did in some of the studios didn't it um so yeah well, i had that conversation this afternoon you know, yeah. the early 70s here in adelaide that's right it could sound crap coming from a studio um then yeah. i go to how we used to market and we, you know, as I, I'll call it, Impress and Beat and all the magazines, Duke, all these, and you had to advertise in there and everything you do. Well, now that's social media, but you have more control because when you went back there, you had to either pay or you needed to be a major to get a, an editorial. Well, you can really push that yourself now and you can have a go yourself. Um, yep. And so I, I give a, a, a... There's a positive for every negative. There's a negative for every positive. And to me, nothing has changed. Now we get back to we're musicians and we need to create music. Rob? Yeah. That yeah. hasn't changed. No, not at all. You know, and then I, I get the, I get a lot of the, yeah, but the music of today is shit and it's this and it's that. Don't talk to me. Everybody has their style. And every generation have their style. Each decade has had its style. And you may not like it, but someone else does. But one thing that never changes from, let's call it the 60s, late 50s onward, is rock and roll. And rock has withheld the test of time. Has disco? No. It petters out, then it comes back. Pop petters yeah. out and it comes back. Rock yeah. has this consistency about it. Um, so if I listen to Judas Priest, they've been consistent, or Scorpions, or Deep Purple, or whatever, they've been able to record for 50 years, and they do what they do. So I then, I then strip it back again and go, nothing has changed, you have to concentrate on what you've got to deliver, and that is music. Um, one of the biggest changes I think that they can't come to grips with yet is that the album is dead. 
the album is finished. It is about song by song. You then package it as, we'll call it an album, after, say, you've put out 10 tracks, all right? But getting there is all about consistency and keeping your audience fed. So you're feeding your audience every month, and statistics show that, that you need to keep, and never more than six weeks, up to about six weeks, you need to keep pushing that music out. And it becomes so much of a... Uh, a business so now we're getting back to what you said we used to rehearse three days a week and then we play another three or four days a week and other bands would play six six days a week and do two gigs a day you know two on some nights two gigs a night right so suddenly do you see my correlation what's what's happening and i'm so so positive and so excited about the future that every day i wake up and i someone sent me a new song i go this is just fantastic Fantastic! I listen to that song, and yeah, man, it's fantastic. And it's just—it's—it's it's an exciting time. What do you think? Um, uh, it's, it's context for me um, because I think how we did it has changed, and I like the ownership of the music myself. Um, I don't like consumerism, and I think we're trained into what we are listening to a lot of the time um, and I don't think there's a lot of choice in that anymore and if you don't fall into the correct box you don't get picked up and I think there's a lot of musicians that are just falling see, by the way but, see, but I don't think the, the word get picked up I don't think anymore it's about being picked up by a major I, I don't hold yeah, no, I, I don't, no I don't yeah. mean it like that I mean yeah. through what, my own experience with the soldiers and like through Laneway and thank you very much for supporting mm. us and having our music out there mm. From that time, you know, really grateful for that. It's fantastic. Um, but the thing is, trying to get, and you explained this to me last time I was in Melbourne in October when I came over and saw you, and um, it was about getting plays and being with the other bands of your sort of level and then having to go through the levels. And that is, to me, it's like an AI choice that is still programmed by a faceless, I don't even know whether it's a human anymore. Um, and if you're not ticking that box, you don't get up the scale of things. I mean, I have a look at how many listeners we've got on um, Spotify, and it's, it's pitiful. Um, well, and then well, I'll look at well, other... well, it is. It, it is, But you, if you say that. But that's because the band don't essentially exist anymore. And without a very aggressive social media, um, not campaign, social media interaction... The, the audience can't feed off what they're listening to, uh, Rob. So therefore, if... But that, that's the operative word, it's feed. Yeah, go on. Well, it, it's consumerism. People are feeding on it as though it's... They just want to consume, 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 because that's what we're, we're trained into now. Well, well, that, um, well that's right. That's, that's called journalism. For, and that's called no, jur- journalism. And if you... And that's where you become, I think, conditioned through journalism to to like or whatever. I mean, read the paper each day and I, I read it and it's so depressing that I, I, I burst out laughing most days because um, uh, I'm one of the guys that subscribes to The Australian. Isn't that depressing? And Yeah, well, I mean, I've got the same through uni. I get the, the Kaiser in The Australian and well, I, I flick through it. You but know, I just... If you, if, you, if you read some articles, you'll get one article that's talking about um, that the the cliff is just about to hit us with mortgage, fixed mor- uh, uh, variable mortgage, uh, sorry, fixed go- mortgages going to variable mortgages. Then two down, it'll talk about how, uh, you know, great um, uh, sales are up. And, and then the next three down, it'll say, oh, David Jones, go, don't in- increase interest rates any further because, you know, people have stopped spending. And it's like, yeah, but hold on, I just read at the top, inflation's at 7.8%. And if we therefore give a pay increase to someone who then spends the money and inflation increases and then goes, you know, do you see the vicious circle? And I... And you read all these articles and you go, my God, it's a hodgepodge of what the hell are we even talking? Do they even know what they're talking about? No, they don't. Not not on an editorial basis because they're just throwing in all these articles. The common person, he just read that and go, what? Um, 
You know, it, yeah. and so I think that conditioning comes through this hogwash of journalism that comes out these days. Uh, yeah, but I mean, that's by design. I mean, a, a friend of mine was a journalist and he wrote the Rock Pages when I was in Melbourne um, um, for The Age and he wrote for Duke and he's passed now, which is kind of strange, but he used to ring me up and tell me different things about the Herald Sun and um, just the way it worked. And I, I mean, my father worked for the advertiser for pretty much most of his life, so I'm familiar with um, the art of journalism yeah. and the way that they sell it, and I'm familiar with advertising. I've been in business all my life as well. Yeah. And, you know, I work on the front line in a music shop with musicians pretty much every day, and I work in an academic facility that has one of the greatest teaching facilities in the whole of Australia that's been there since, like, the late... 1800 yeah. um, that people don't realise. And when I talk to the academics and the people that are about all of that, it's still very much about programming. But the thing is, music is not an individual choice now. It's a mass consumption product that people get fed. And you said fed. You know, that's what turned me on to that word. And that's why I'm at uni trying to work it out as well. I mean, I'm education is really my special field. That's what my degree is in. Uh, my honours degree is in music education and pedagogy. So I like how people create music, how they learn to create music, and the process of learning um, is really, really important. Everything else I've got no control over. Um, when I read the paper, I just know, you know, I believe very little of it because I don't see it for real. What I see for real is when I talk to musicians every day and how many gigs they're doing, yeah, um, I talk to students that are studying and what their passion is, whether it's jazz, whether it's classical, whether it's marching band, or whether it's rock, whether it's metal, whether it's punk. There's so many genres that things have been split into. Um, but people can specialise in that now, and the government, you know, are kind of subsidising that in music programs, but art programs and funding are getting cut. Well, we well, 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 it's interesting, you know, with the New South Wales election that just occurred and I saw a big uh, thing in the Music Network today, a big article saying, hurrah for Labor, they'd gotten in and this is, let's see what this, we hope this means big things for the music industry and whatever. And interestingly, here in Victoria, when we had the last state election, um, and that dipstick from the Liberals, he'd written, I got something on Facebook that said, you know, if you want to talk to me, you know, he's the head of the Libs, you want to talk to me, send me a message, I'll reply to everything. And I thought, well, you can't, but someone's got to. So I, I wrote... I not think you are allowed to swear. Yeah, well, I wrote, this, I wrote this letter to him going, do you know, if you had half a brain, you'd be really... Um, promoting the uh, music, local music industry. It's worth billions of dollars. Um, you know, we only need a couple of hits worldwide. And, yep. you know, uh, Labor, I just talk about it, but half the time you can never get the money because it's uh, hidden in with the indie mafia who control it all. And yep. um, I said, you know, you, if you were to do a big push on this, you could really get some real votes. I never, ever heard from the guy. <laughs> He never, he never yeah. responded. And but then when I they s- won't. I mean, the, the thing is that we're, as musicians, we're really observers of what is going on and we write songs about it, what moves us emotionally and, you know, what floats our boat melodically. I, I mean, that's a really important part, but trying to have an influence. Um, I mean, we had Peter Garrett here a couple of weeks ago at the uni and he was doing an acoustic gig yeah. with an acoustic guitar with some students from the Old Conservatorium. Yeah. Um, but he was talking about um, land rights and climate change and all of those, you know, they're very significant topics. Um, and, you know, they're at the forefront of everything you read and see this day, you know. But the, the essence for me was, hey, Pete, can you tell me how you learned how to do what you're doing but not all? You know, I, I know he went and saw the angels and watched Doc Neeson and he learned from that. And like, things like that, I think, inspire musicians to keep yeah. creating. Yeah. Things that don't inspire us are uh, trying to get hits on Spotify, trying to pump up the social media, trying to do that. I mean, people, corporations have paid people millions of dollars to do that. You can't compete with that at our level. You know, well, um, I, and I, I tend, and I tend to, I disagree. I disagree with you, and I disagree yeah, I on that. And that's and that's what's great is to have a, a, a jewel off like this. And um, I totally disagree with you because young artists know how to work their social media, and before you know it, they can be getting a genuine twenty thousand, hundred thousand, two hundred and fifty thousand streams. Now. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. But the, I mean, the older acts don't get a chance against that because we well, don't understand and well, we don't embrace it. Well, no, they, they don't, and but, you know, 
time moves. But it doesn't make the music any less valid. No, it no it just again a, a large audience. No, of like course, you get buried in all the chart all the time. No, no, I don't disagree with you. But time moves on, and some people will get left behind, and others won't. Yeah. I'm, I'm 62 this year myself, and um, yeah, I probably need it because you know I'm losing my hair. But um, you know, I'll lend you some of mine. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so you know. But I've tried to, you know, I'm learning every day and I've tried to adapt to this change. I do tutorials like they're coming out of my backside, um, yeah. learning about whether it be YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, uh, LinkedIn, where the woke society live, LinkedIn being absolutely useless. Um, and I love it. I really would <laughs> like to put some comments up there one day. Does anybody use the word fuck? Anyway, um, but, you know... Um, I, 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 I think that I, I've taught myself and I'm learning still every day. There's something new. I get something every day comes out. You know, like, to, you know, we were only discussing in the office today that um, uh, we use Waves plugins for a lot of our audio uh, stuff. Ooh. And they've now just finished. You cannot buy Waves audios anymore. You have to subscribe, okay? So yeah. we don't have an objection to that because we subscribe to a lot of things that we use and, you know, but we, we all had a chuckle about it. It's another subscription that you've got to make sure you've got under control and you know and it's bankrupt each month because everything is now moving to this subscription base. But you've got – so the thing is, yes, I want the tools, but then I have to control it financially, and so um, there's a whole nother level to it again because, remember, if you don't control it financially, you can't do it next month because you've got no money. Um, right. So, you know, we were That's chuckling about too, that. Even under it too. You yeah. know, and, and then I had to go through the list and go through and you're having a look at what you get, what you don't get, and then how you activate it, USB sticks. And it's, it's constant, uh, Rob. It's so constant that you're learning every day. But I take that as a real stimulus mentally. Um, yeah. And that uh, I'm moving with the times and I'm trying to do the best I can as opposed to falling back. You know, uh, I have got some musicians who we're working with who I'm trying to get to do collabs with because yeah. they're finding it difficult to do anything because, you know, time's moved on. But they're fantastic songwriters. So I... I come from the, I'm just, I'm enthused, I'm energised, I love it, and it is what it is, so I'm going to make it work for us. And, you know, we have some bands that are, uh, who are no longer playing, who are still doing really well. Um, and, you know, some bands get it and some don't. It's just all too hard. But that's why I like to get ideas from, uh, well, not ideas, but I like to feed off people like yourself, Um uh, who at uni and see well, what's happening? What are you guys talking about? Yeah, I mean, I've been a, a PhD candidate and kind of like a watching a room <laughs> writing my thesis most of the time. But you know, I'm at uni a lot of the time as well. And with um, you know, the Elder Conservatorium is a, a vast uh, dichotomy, really, from pop music to classical music to yeah. jazz. Um, so you've got all these different extremes and specialist people, whether they're doing performance studies, whether they're doing historiological study, yeah. um, you know, and it, it, a lot of my class, you know, like I'd say 90% of them um, are either from classical or, well, most of them are from classical and the rest are from jazz and, you know, there's a couple of pop. Don't, start, pop. don't start me with the classical and the ballet and all those things, mate. I know. I I'm know. so I'm anti because they cause I get all the money, right? And but that's what I mean. The thing is, you know, you go back to... You were talking about the, the politicians before, and I know um, there's flogging a dead horse, but I just found it curious when I was looking at who has the arts portfolio here in South Australia, and then you have a look at, and it was Marshall, and, like, what did he get his degree in at university? And it was business and economics. Like, why doesn't an artist, you know? I sat in the South Australian Music Hall of Fame um, committee over here, and I said the same thing to them. I'm sitting in a room full of the brightest minds here in Adelaide, and how come we haven't got any representation in Parliament? How come Marshall, who's got a degree in business and economics, runs the art, local art portfolio here? Mm. And then the federal arts minister is the same thing. They've got a degree in business and economics. Why wouldn't you have a music major um, that's got a degree in music business yeah. or music pedagogy or music education running those portfolios? And who sees, Rob, and who sees that if we can 
get some international number ones, the amount of money that would roll into this country is phenomenal, you know? Yeah, but, you know, we're dictated to by the Yanks and we always have been, you know. Um, I well, I'm not, I, no, I don't take it as much as that because we it's what we want to do. I, um, I, I love, it is I love, I love the Yanks. I love the English. And, um, I, yeah, you know, me too would be drinking vodka and eating potatoes if it wasn't for them, but apparently. Um, but if you get to have a look, and I've done that with Boucher in his interview, you know, he said when Buffalo Drive had Lysbeen Goobers in the top, 10, yep. he said, have a look at the top 50, and I did, and um, 70% of the bands in the top 50 were American, um, 25% of the bands, oh, oh, sorry, it was less than that, it was 60% were American, I think 28% yeah, but hold, hold on. Australian. Hold on, what's their population compared to ours? But this is in Australia. Yeah, well, in that, in that case, see, I'm not a socialist, and, and, I'm, not, and I'm not a communist, mate, so why not get someone with some guts in there to go, well, 50% of the chart has to be made up of local content. I mean, make it, it, aggr- and, and make it aggressive and say 50% of it. So therefore, uh, radio yes. has to yes. play that much because our music is as good as anybody's. It doesn't matter Absolutely. whether it's not a hit, but it's yes. still bloody good. So yes. um, I'm going to say I'm not a socialist, I'm not a communist, but because we're only 25 million people, well, how can you compete with America? You can't. So therefore, we'll force it and we'll force people. And, you know, but they're, they're too shit scared to do any of that. No no politician's ever going to enact anything like that because all they're worried about is that they've got to get their benefits at the end of their uh, tenure in politics <laughs> and get their free airfares and get their pension. Um, mate, no, I mean, it, it's just, it's sickening. I mean... It's sickening here. It's sickening on a federal level. Um, it's all talk, and therefore we need to, you know, we need to. I think we've got to have people like Laneway Music who are out there, anti-establishment, who are prepared to, you know, push the wheelbarrow and give artists uh, an opportunity, and that not lock them into contracts that keep them, you know, locked in for years and years, and uh, they feel like, well, they've got handcuffs on. It's about being creative getting out there and taking the best opportunities you got with your product and mm. going where you need to go to actually earn a living. Um, and it might might not always be with laneway music, you know. Uh, but anyway, more discussions for another day. I mean, we've been going yeah, yeah. well over an yeah. hour and it's been really, really good discussing, you know, um, where you've come from and what you're doing at uni and, and getting your opinion on you know where we're at today and i as i say isn't it fantastic when i can have a totally opposite opinion to yours um and uh, you know and we can still discuss it and want the right out still the same outcome and that's the artist to have some success yeah i mean but that's the whole point you know everyone's got a, a point of view and it's, it's good to be able to exercise that in a healthy form so thank you for the opportunity fantastic it's been good talking to you rob and we look to we look forward to doing it again because you you know the study that you're doing and i think there's plenty more we could talk for another hour really it just takes me devising some really tricky questions for you and uh you know, putting the ping pricks in. <laughs> Come on, give me some answers to these. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. All right. I'll write to the challenge. I'll um I'll be looking forward to seeing you in Melbourne next month and yeah, um, yep. and catching up with the Virgin Soldiers. Bar on the twenty second. People come and pack it out. That's it. All right, we'll talk to you <laughs> soon. See you, Rob. No worries. Thanks, Ben. Bye. Cheers. And there it is, another laneway talks. If you enjoyed that, there's more. Just search Laneway Talks for more great conversations. G'day folks, Mark Allen here and... The Ox, David Schwartz. Uh, and we've started a brand new podcast called... A Couple of Blokes, A Couple of Beers, and we're just chewing the fat. Couple of Blokes, Couple of Beers, with Ox and Marco. I'm thinking about whitening my teeth just so when I smile... There's a new episode every Wednesday. Have you got a weight issue? Of course I do. <laughs> it's a stupid <laughs> loaded question. A Couple of Blokes, Couple of Beers, with David Schwartz and Mark Allen. I'm eating the kids Maltese. You're eating their of... Christmas present. I am a piece of garbage. <laughs> Listen wherever you get your podcasts.